Last time you were on, we discussed the uh, China trade deal, of course, and uh, did discuss the balance of power and negotiations between Robert Lighthizer and the president. You said that if Robert Lighthizer had uh, all the cards and the power, that a deal was harder. Where do you stand on the, the, the belief of who's leading the negotiation and where we're going to end up now? Well, there's no question that Robert Lighthizer is leading the negotiation in the sense that he's the man with the command of the detail. Uh, but we saw just the other day that the president has the power to overrule him even in the terminology of the deal. He was on TV explaining why he doesn't like the phrase memorandum of understanding and Robert Lighthizer very quickly had to uh, drop that phrase and get on with uh, Trumpian language uh, like trade deal. So I think the big question, and I'm, I'm here in Washington uh, thinking a lot about this, is whether or not President Trump is going to overrule Robert Lighthizer and take a deal that, that Lighthizer would regard as inadequate, as, as weak. And I, I very much hope he doesn't do that, because I think Robert Lighthizer has been doing an excellent job driving a very hard bargain. And when Lighthizer says we're not there yet, I take that very seriously. And to that point, Neil, I'm, it seems to me the, the key element in all of this is going to be enforcement and what that mechanism looks like. And thus, that whole process is going to take time as well, because even if you do get some sort of short-term deal right now and a decision to not increase tariffs, to be able to see China actually carry out what it agrees to, which it hasn't done in the past, despite other, uh, you know, plans to, to plans to the contrary, that that's still, you're looking at a timeline that could stretch into years, right? Well, this is not going to be over at Mar-a-Lago if uh, indeed President Trump meets Xi Jinping uh, there in the coming weeks, uh, because ultimately it's about much more than just the trade deficit now. If you think back, say, a year when uh, all of this was kicking off, uh, the Chinese assumed that if they just could figure out a way of reducing the bilateral trade deficit, then President Trump would be happy and it would all be over very quickly. It took them a while to realize that, uh, that Mr. Trump was in earnest and that Robert Lighthizer was in very deep earnest about getting the Chinese to do much more, in particular about going after their uh, Made in China 2025 program, which is essentially a program using all means, fair and foul, to get China as far up the value chain in terms of technological sophistication as possible. So this is a big, complicated issue. And I don't expect the trade war to become a trade peace via a tweet or indeed a dinner between two presidents. The other thing I'd add, which is really significant here, is that in the course of the last year, the trade war has become about much more than just trade. It's in fact a tech war that is also going on now as the United States Congress goes after China in a number of different ways, potentially limiting exports of very sophisticated chips uh, from the US to China and also limiting Chinese investment into U.S. tech companies. I think the tech war is much more important ultimately than the trade war. You, you could say the trade war with tariffs and, uh, uh, and negotiations is a sort of 1970s throwback, the kind of thing that happened mm -hmm. in the Nixon Ford years. But the tech war, that is a 21st century story about competition in 5G, competition in artificial intelligence, yeah. and even co quantum computing. That is not going to be over anytime soon. In fact, it could define the new Cold War of our time. Uh, Neil, uh, is the North Korea issue linked to the China trade? I mean, we're sort of reporting them as separate stories today, but uh, is any progress with North Korea possible without a China trade deal? And if so, which should the president really be focusing his efforts on more? Which matters more to the U.S.? When you ask diplomats on either side this question, they tend to say there's no linkage. Uh, but I have a sense that the president sees there as being some linkage. It's been his assumption from the outset that China uh, would be the, the power that could put pressure on North Korea uh, to shift its position on its nuclear arms program. I think that's a vain hope uh, in the sense that it's not obvious to me that doing any kind of deal with China is greatly going to increase the president's leverage with Kim Jong-un. I mean, that leverage was pretty weak to begin with. And uh, it must be said that since his first summit with Kim Jong-un, he's only given the North Korean dictator an easier time in return for not very much. So I'd rather there was no linkage. In my view, what President Trump did with North Korea was to make too uh, easy a deal too quickly without teeth, without enforcement. I really hope he's not going to do the same uh, thing with China, and I hope that Robert Lighthizer, in that sense, gets his way.
Neil, uh, there, all eyes are on Vietnam right now with this summit and, and these, you know, denuclearization talks and what that definition could look like. But meantime, you've seen this really fast and, and quite frankly, alarming uh, ratcheting up of tensions between two other nuclear countries in the last couple of days as well, uh, India and Pakistan. Should investors be watching that more closely? And is this something that could actually really, truly spill over into a full-fledged conflict? That's funny. I thought all eyes were on Michael Cohen rather than on Hanoi. But you're quite right to raise the question of uh, whether we should be more worried. <laughs> I've been in a lot of places today, <laughs> I think. <laughs> a, 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 a good question is whether we should be more worried than markets appear to be about the fact that India and China are engaged in uh, military hostilities with at least one fighter plane shot down uh, uh, by the Pakistanis. You know, I doubt very much that this is going to escalate uh, into full-blown war. Of course, if it did, that would be extremely alarming since these are nuclear powers. Uh, but I've, I've seen this kind of thing before. It's really all about Kashmir from the vo point of view of the Pakistanis. And I suspect from the point of view of the Indians, it's all about Mr. Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi's prospects of re-election, which at the moment do don't look too bright. So I think it's understandable that markets are not getting too panicked. I think the general expectation is that this is uh, a little local difficulty and uh, it will not escalate into something bigger. Neil, I want to ask you quickly about Brexit. Uh, Prime Minister Theresa May has uh, promised uh, various Remainers that she will offer a vote to allow them uh, to delay Brexit if uh, no deal as an eventuality is looking more likely. Do, do you think no deal is off the table now? It does look that way. Uh, I mean, it's, of course, uh, become the longest-running political soap opera in the world. Uh, but my sense is that the probability of a no-deal outcome at the end of March and a, a really major economic shock to the UK. That probability is, is down in the, in the single digits now. Uh, and the most likely outcome, I think, is that uh, she's going to have one more attempt with her withdrawal agreement and I suspect will fail. And one reason she'll fail is precisely that the no deal danger has been reduced. And, and that just reduces the incentive to vote for her withdrawal agreement. My fear is that what we're going to end up with is a postponement, an extension, some further uh, months are going to pass. But at the end of it all, Britain's going to be in the same situation with deep divisions on both parties about what exactly Brexit means. So unfortunately, I can hear the distant sound of a can being kicked down the road. Kind of familiar in European politics, isn't it? <laughs>